What a start for both Northwestern and Illinois as the Wildcats and Illini each post week zero wins. Northwestern doing so in conference fashion with the upset of Nebraska, Illinois for the second straight year winning a week zero game at home. Last year it was against the Huskers, this year against Wyoming. Welcome inside the Monday press conference edition of Big Ten Live. Over the course of both today and tomorrow, you will hear from every Big Ten coach whose team plays this weekend. On this particular show, you will hear from Jim Harbaugh, Mel Tucker, Jeff Brom, James Franklin, those two most recent men I mentioned, meeting in their season opener on Thursday night in West Lafayette. Paul Christ, Greg Schiano going non-conference, while Tom Allen and Brett Bielema, who you will also hear from today, play a Friday night game in Bloomington, conference opener for both the Hoosiers and the Illini. We will start in just a minute with Jim Harbaugh, but a fascinating announcement by the Michigan head man on Monday who decided to name Cade McNamara as the Michigan starter for the opener against Colorado State. Now, interestingly enough, week two against Hawaii will not be McNamara, but it will be J.J. McCarthy. This is a fascinating decision by a coach who is clearly very confident in both his quarterbacks and in his team's ability to win in the non-conference. You rarely, I have probably never heard a coach make a decision like this, naming both a week one and week two starter in which those names are two different quarterbacks. So to hear more about that decision and more about what Michigan faces this week and in the 2022 season, here is Wolverine head coach Jim Harbaugh. Well, yeah. Started. Now I'd like to also uh, congratulate uh, Kara Hutchins on uh, her amazing career, um, her retirement. Uh, I think the winningest softball coach uh, known in the entire world. Uh, it's great to uh, it's great to uh, that her legacy is going to continue under under Bonnie and her and her team, and uh, great to have another Michigan alum coaching a Michigan team, but. Uh, can't talk enough about Carroll. I mean, winning his coach in history. Um, 22 Big Ten championships, on and on. But uh, I know she's going to be still around, so uh, she's a great colleague. And, uh, and we love her. Go Blue. Uh, camp has been good. Uh, we're excited to start the, uh, the season. Uh, camp's over. It's now game week. Um, yeah, really. Give a lot of credit to our players, the way they, the kind of shape they came in, the way our, our coaches developed, uh, strength coaches, assistant coaches. Um, you know, very, very, very healthy roster as well, and uh, excited to let them have at it this week. We've named the starting quarterback. Uh, we're going to, Cade McNamara will start the first game, JJ McCarthy will start the second. And, We've also uh, posted the depth chart uh, at the other positions as well. So uh, we're ready to roll. Back left, Aaron. Jim, I know you've explained the quarterback arrangement, but how long are you willing to let that go? Are you determined to get a starter for week three, or are you going to let go of the season? I mean, it's uh, the. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a process. It is a process. I mean, the, for me to sta stand up. I mean, no person. I mean, that's biblical. No person knows what the future holds and um, it's a process and it's going to be based on performance uh, but we don't we're not going to withhold you know any any good uh, any good thing that's uh, you know both uh, both have been tremendous uh, quarterbacks we think that that both can are, are capable of leading our team to a championship so I mean that's that's good we're going to keep cultivating that and uh, you know, so, yeah, that uh, somebody, some people have asked, you know, was that, you know, what, how'd you come to that decision? And, you know, was it based on some kind of uh, NFL model? No, it's, I mean, it's really it's based, based biblical. You know, Solomon, um, he was known for to being a pretty, pretty wise person. Stand on the left, Isaiah. The Abia Noma, what was the process for? Bringing him in, what what did you see in him, and what have you seen from him so far? In the yeah, really good. So, uh, graduate transfer, uh, Iabianoma has uh, been practicing with the team for 
uh, about 10 days, 12 days, something, something like that. And uh, he's been really good. Um, he's been a been a great teammate, and uh, you know, look forward to seeing what he can do this uh, this coming season. But I think he'll be, you know, he'll be hopefully playing right away uh, in, in the first game. He's shown some some outstanding outstanding uh, assets that he can bring to the team. Stand on the left, Joe. Jim, as, as pleased as you seem to be with both quarterbacks, do you wish one had separated, or are you fine with it being so even? Is that a good or a bad thing? It's, I, I can't see it other than a, than a good thing. You know, it's, uh, and, and they're actually both playing their best football since they've been here. Cade, Cade is arguably one of the most improved players on the team. Um, and he's playing his best football. I mean, JJ did not he did not have spring practice, but uh, he you know he's at, ascended to uh, you know to where he's at based on based on his performance. So uh, yeah, that's a that's a really really good thing. And um, yeah, I mean, there's no there's no demotion for Cade McNamara. Um, you know, he's playing his best football. It is a promotion for JJ. Um, you know, based on based on what he's been able to do as well. On the left, Chris. Jim, would you anticipate playing both quarterbacks in the opener as well? Yes. Uh, you know, there's, there, we're not going to, you know, it's like you don't withhold, you know, something, something good that can, can help the football team. So, uh, yes, I can see that. And then the backup offensive lineman, you mentioned Greg Crippen and Carson Barnhart, who are some of the other guys that were, are pushing for that 2D? Yeah, Jeff, Jeff Percy uh, at left tackle. Uh, definitely looking uh, Geo El Hadid is doing some really good things. Uh, Reese Atterbury would be would be another that's uh, right there in the in the two deep doing a good job. And Raheem Anderson would be would be next. So we feel like we have those uh, those would be the top the top eleven right now. Ryan Hayes, Trevor Keegan, Olu, Zach Zinner, Trent A. Jones, Carson Barnhart. Reese Atterbury, Jeff Percy, Geo, uh, Greg Crippen, and, and Raheem Anderson. The back left, Michael. Jim, uh, following up on that question about Yavi, what was sort of the vetting process for some of his off-field issues, and what made you feel comfortable bringing in a guy that has run into some problems in other programs? Well, Yavi graduated from uh, Tennessee Martin. Uh, a very, very easy uh, you know, process in, in talking to his former teammates that are on our team. Uh, I've always, uh, Yabi, Yabi is somebody we recruited, I recruited right out of high school and always felt like I don't know, we, we, we finished maybe second in that. I've always, I've always really, really enjoyed being around Yabi and I'm not uh, aware of the, the vague off field you know, issues that you refer to, um, but uh, as it stands now, I mean, he's a college graduate, um, really vouched for by his by his teammates, and and uh, you know he's just a great guy to be around on a day-to-day -day basis. So, I mean, no man holds the knows the future, but uh, I think it uh, looks very good for and bright for for Yabi. Over here on the right, Austin. Jim, when you're evaluating quarterbacks in the first two games, is that something where you'll put the numbers into a formula that gives you an answer, or is that going to be more of a gut feel with you and the staff in terms of how to play? Yeah, based on performance, uh, I mean, there's there's not one criteria that you could you could plug in and say uh, this will be this will be the factor, that'll be the factor, uh, and I want both those both the quarterbacks to to you know keep playing their game, and you know what not. You know, keep enhancing what they do really well, uh, improving some of the things that that uh, they need to work on. But definitely not trying to play somebody else's game or the other quarterback's game, or you know, hit a metric or a number that that uh, you know is going to be the deciding factor. Because because uh, you know there there won't be one other than uh, it's you know, we play the best players and uh, based on performance and and uh, that's that's the. That's the metric. Meritocracy. Alejandro. Uh, Jim, you mentioned Mason Graham as someone you could start as a freshman. What, what did he show in fall camp to deserve that? 
Yeah, we're, we're thinking that in the base package that uh, Mason right now is is uh, he's he's uh, top of the depth chart as a as a defensive tackle. Um, the other player is uh, Rashawn, Rashawn Benny, who's surgeon like like you can't can't imagine uh, both in the base and in the in the sub fronts as well. But um, Mason, from the day he got here, has been been uh, a very solid player. You, you saw it in the spring game. He was really highly, highly drafted in that, in that spring game and, and played, played very well. So he's played good. He's earned it. And um, count on him for, for a lot of snaps in this first game. Turn to Cameron. Coach, when you have one quarterback starting one week and another starting another, how do you judge them differently with two different defenses that are going up against? Well, it's not, not going to be exactly the same, but it's where we're at right now is that it's practice versus games. Uh, you know, we think we'll have a better, better understanding uh, after, after the two play in the, in the games. And we talked about earlier, I mean, this is, this is something we have to withhold. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a great chance that we can play both of the quarterbacks, you know, in this game, the next game. And, you know, in, in the third game as well. So, I don't know. You know, you just don't know. It's just that's that's the point. I mean, you can speculate, you can, you can, uh, you can predict, but no man knows the future. Where are you? Yeah, Jim. Um, I'm wondering if if the current uh, sort of landscape of college football at all weighed into this, just with more people transferring and moving. Because I know in years past, you've you've tended to like to to name a guy and sort of go with that. Does, does that play any factor, or is this a decision? If you had these two quarterbacks, maybe five, seven years ago, what have you, that you think you would have made the same choice? Yeah, it's just specific for for this team, and and, and where these, you know, these these uh, two players are, are playing. I mean, they are. And if you're, you know, the question is speculating. No, there's no other intent or, or motive other than you know, what's good for our our football team. But it's it's it's. I understand it. I understand, you know, the landscape of. Here's the landscape I do understand: is that, you know, if a coach coach gets up gets up here and gives you the normal cliches, then um, then you 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 seem very offended as journalists. Um, <laughs> but also, when a coach, you know, or a person, you know, gives you really well thought out, you know, in depth, honest, you know, tells you the the, the the truth of where they where things stand. There's a tendency to question motive or question intent. So uh, I understand that. I'm going to keep doing it the way I've you know, been doing it, which is speak to speak the absolute truth as I know it and believe it to be. On the right, Larry. Jim, uh, uh, you mentioned releasing the depth chart. That's a departure from the past. Just why, why are you sharing that now? Uh, just, just felt like I, just felt like, uh, you know, I guess just for our team. So we're doing that with our team and do that for for everybody. A lot of times when you do that internally in the team, it has a way to way of getting out there. Yeah. You know, so uh, we'll just, you know, so why? Yes, that's sometimes it gets out it gets out there anyway. So we might as well might as well release it. So, but it's yeah, good. Sure. Jim, mine's kind of a two-pronged question for you, I guess, just in generalities. With the success of last season in the Big Ten Championship, what is the excitement level for your team going into week one of this season? And as well, how are they motivated by not finishing the job last year in the, in the college playoff? Yeah, like, I, like I've said, uh, you know, the excitement's really high. Uh, guys can't wait to play. I'm really, really looking forward to watching our guys com compete and watching them play. Um, you know, really looking forward to, um, you know, how they're going to play. You know, I really feel like they can, can cut it loose, let it, let it rip. Um, I think they can play with hustle, constant hustle, hustle at all times. It's one of the things I'm be looking for, for the most guys, uh, guys, running on defense, running to the ball, and uh, you know, offensively, you know, also running to the ball, uh, trying to get that. That second block. If you don't have the ball, then then you become a blocker, uh, no matter whether it was a run or a pass. Um, so yeah, looking. I think they're ready to do that. 
and uh, prepared to do that and, and, and highly motivated to, to play this game. Ryan, given that you guys do practice behind door, uh, closed doors and you like to keep things kind of you know, in-house, uh, why did you want to make the quarterback situation or, in, or bring public scrutiny to that, I mean, with playing it out in these first two games? So, so everybody, everybody knows exactly where it's at. I think, um, you know, inside of our team, you know, players, um, and coaches, you know, reasonable people have seen a lot of football. I mean, they, they look at it as neck and neck, and um, and that's that's what it is. Um, so, yeah, we're we're sharing that. I know the other guys, other players have shared that with. With the media, so uh, yeah, it's it's something that's that's already out there, and this is this is our approach. We feel like it's uh, you know the the best way to go, and um, that's uh, it's got it's got to play out. It's a process, and be based on on performance. It is what it is, and it's a good thing. You know, I think a, a lot of teams would like to have that. Would like to have that. Uh, you know, be in that position. So, um, and I, and I, you know, continue. Even though I see the things written, you know, the the adage, uh, somebody in here or whatever. If you don't have two, if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have any. You know, I see some some heads nodding. I mean, is that true? Is that a fact? Is that a fact? Is that a fact for anywhere? Or is that? I mean, is it a fact on this? You know, on this team? I don't think that's a. That's a proven fact. Got time for about four more. We're starting with John. Coach, how do you feel about the development of your safeties in particular and your defense overall coming into the year now? Safeties in particular? Uh, yeah, RJ Moten, uh, Makari Page, Rod Moore, those three safeties have, have been outstanding. Also, uh, Caden Colesar uh, will be in a rotation. But those, those first three I mentioned will. Um, you know, they'll be, depending on the package, dime, base, or nickel, um, you know, those, will, those three will, will be in the game rotating in as starters. Have you been, I mean, people talked about the defense as being where a lot of more people had to be plugged in. Have you been, I know you mentioned before that you thought it was going to be better than a lot of people thought. I said I thought it, it had a chance to be. Um, and, again, you don't know that, but... Uh, it has a chance to be based on the fact that uh, the uh, you know, like like David Ajabo last year didn't know that he was going to turn into the the player that that he did. Um, I see a lot of hungry guys at those positions. Um, you know the safety position, you know in particular. I mean all all four of those players have really been competing and um, and battling and uh, you know for for our football team. Same at outside backer. I see that. That taking place, guys are hungry and uh, want to play. Based on that, it has a chance. It has a chance. Um, it has a chance to be better. It has a license. It has the ability to be. And now, now you go have at it and and uh, see if it can be. Right here, David. Uh, Coach, you mentioned how highly Mason was saw in spring practice and in spring game. Did he enter fall camp? At the top or near the top of the depth chart, or was that something that, as fall camp progressed, he started standing out a lot more? Yeah, as as it progressed, um, that's uh, that's where he moved in the base defense. He wasn't he wasn't starter going in, um, and really, Chris Jenkins was, was the starting defensive tackle going into fall camp. Now, Chris Jenkins is the starting end, so he moved from tackle to end, and uh, so in the base package. Uh, you know, based on a base front, that's that's what we think right now is that's who our starters are. I left Michael. Mozzie Smith's starting a nose, and, and uh, I think I mentioned the the three edge guys uh, in the interview the other day: Jalen Harrell, Taylor Upshaw, Mike Morris. All three of those we look at as as starting edges. Jim, I'm not sure what Cade wants to do long term, but I know he could come back next year if he wanted to use his COVID year, and I think. You could even come back again after that using the red shirt, maybe from his freshman year. Yeah. Uh, with how highly you think of both quarterbacks, Kate and JJ, to what extent do you think 
the competition will just kind of continue in perpetuity as long as they're both on the same roster? Uh, I don't know. There's uh, no, nobody knows, you know. Um, and, and one thing will f um, factor in, I think somebody was trying to allude to that question, so uh, I'll just give you my thoughts on it. Um, I mean, you're talking about two, you know, gritty competitors um, and, and fighters in Cade McNamara and J.J. McCarthy. So to answer the question, did, did it factor in that, that uh, one would transfer or not? No. My, my thoughts are that they, they are both the kind of guys that, that don't flinch, fold, or quit at the slightest whiff of um, adverse circumstances or something that doesn't go their way. Uh, that's not that's not Kate McNamara. That's not J.J. McCarthy. Aaron, on that note, could you speak to the camp J.J. has had so far? Because as you said, he didn't practice in the spring. Yeah, it's been it's been tremendous, uh, and he didn't he didn't have spring ball, but he's he's continued to to flourish, getting getting better and better, you know, uh, every day. Um, as I said, Kate's done the same thing. I mean, they've. They have both elevated their game you know, accordingly, playing their game, uh, what they're really good at, and, and, and also working on the things that, uh, that they, can, they can improve. Cade's been, been you know, really been much improved in, in just about every area, uh, including, including managing the pocket and, and uh, extending plays. Um, you know, that's... That's JJ's, you know, one of his fortes as a, as a, as a player, and I see JJ, you know, doing that really well and continue to do that well, but also, uh, you know, improving on going through the reads and taking what the defense gives them and protecting the football. So, uh, yeah, both have, have, uh, have really had great camps. Last question on the left, Angelique. Jim, I know you said this is a process, but if they keep playing Kate, Kate and JJ at a high level, as you said they're playing now, how long are you willing to take the process? Do you have a, a maybe a little bit of a timetable in your head when you'd like to settle this? You, you just don't know. I mean, one of the biggest factors will be, I mean, uh, probably if it's, if it's exactly it is right now, today, um, coming out of just out of practice and it continues to be like that in the games and yeah that'll be up to us as coaches to to uh, be able to utilize both both players um, you know their what they what they bring to our football team you know for the best of the football team I mean, that's that's where it stands today so you can see play both of them like you did last year I mean you know, one's a starter and one comes in a lot like like Jay did last year oh, that's ab absolutely a possibility All right. Thanks, guys. No question and no surprise, the hot topic of the Michigan Monday press conference, Jim Harbaugh naming Cade McNamara the week one starter, J.J. McCarthy week two. Harbaugh said this was not based on any NFL model. As a matter of fact, he said it was biblical referencing Solomon. We will see how it all plays out week one and week two for the Wolverines. Year two of the Mel Tucker era, a complete departure in a positive way after a struggle in year number one. 11 victories for the Spartans. Now they try to build on that in 2022, and they'll get a bit of a head start. They begin on Friday night against Western Michigan. Other non-conference games include Akron and Washington. You see some winnable games at the start of Big Ten play, but a really tough middle of the Michigan State schedule as they go Ohio State, Wisconsin, and Michigan back to back, though there is a bye week scheduled between those Wisconsin and Michigan games. As for now, Coach Tuck focused on one thing and one thing only, that being the Friday night date with Western Michigan. All right, so thanks for being here today. Really appreciate you coming out. We are looking forward to uh, getting the season started Friday night in the woodshed. Really appreciate our fans, you know, our students. Um, guys are preparing hard. We had a Tuesday type practice today. So we're well into our preparation uh, for Western. And, uh, so with that, I'll open it up for questions.
and I was wondering where you're at with the uh, kicker situation with adding Ben and kind of what you think of those guys in that room overall heading into the opener. Yeah, they did a good job today at the end of practice, so um, we'll make a decision at some point, and, but I feel good about it. Uh, you know, you guys had a, you said you were going to do kind of a, a little walkthrough on Friday. Did that, did you end up doing that kind of a, like a mock game sort of environment? And what, what, is, what do the guys get from that when they haven't been out there maybe for a year to try and replicate everything in their mind again? Yeah, we had a fast Friday type practice. So we, we did go fast and then, and then we shifted to the mock, mock game. It was just basically going through our, our uh, kind of our routine. You know when we get to the stadium, and and then how we go out for warm ups, and how do we uh, how do we flex, and where we go in our uh, position groups for uh, you know pregame warm up and things like that, you know how we uh, how we uh, handle like the one on one, the seven on seven, the team periods pregame, and then how we you know come out you know of the tunnel, and uh, then we did some scenarios, some you know situational things, just talking through offense, defense, special teams, you know how we uh, come out for halftime and things like that. I know, I know we've joked about it with Peyton a little bit, but was there any, is there anything to that about him sort of being able to help you guys a little bit just with a first year coordinator, obviously his dad, uh, is that something where him and Scotty sit down in the summer and have lunch or something, or is he helping you guys out in defensive meetings or uh, yeah, defensive means or anything like that this week at all? No. We're here. Mel, I'm just, uh, obviously this is now the, the third year. I feel like every year there's a, a little different kind of feeling. The first year was, obviously a little bit different and going into the second year no one really knew much but now the expectations feel like they've been ramped up so much after the way last year went do you do you sense a different feel from these guys like there's you know what i mean there's there's not an unknown now they know hey we've gotten to this point and and now we expect to be at a certain point do you sense that from them going into from our players yeah well i mean it's really it's the the, the expectations from the outside have really uh ramped up so to speak and, uh, you know, like we're ranked going into the season um, and there's an expectation for us, you know, to be a, to be a good football team and, and things like that and to be able to win games where, you know, a year ago we weren't ranked. We were picked to be one of the worst, you know, five teams in the country and things like that. So it's really the, you know, the external expectations, I think, you know, have, have uh, shifted. Well, it's, it's really, you know, it, we, have, we have standards and we have, you know, expectations for ourselves and they're high and that hasn't changed. Now that you're heading into game week, I, where do you see the biggest growth from Peyton? Really leadership. Really uh, not just leading by example, but being more vocal with his teammates, not just on the offense, but, you know, the defense as well. He's, uh, he's really grown in that regard, and I'm really proud of him. Wondering the importance of winning at home. I mean, yesterday, I think you guys put on your Twitter page something along the lines of how you guys didn't lose a game last year in the woodshed. And so how much emphasis you're putting on that this week as you head into this game against Western? Yeah, winning at home is important. We appreciate our fans. You know, our, our home, uh, the woodshed should be, a, should be an advantage for us, and it is. Um, and it's important that, uh, that we play well at home. And so we were undefeated at home a year ago. That was a goal of ours, you know, to protect our home. And that's always going to be the goal for us is to play well at home and to, and to, uh, and to win at home every, every game that we play at home. Mel, who's returning kickoffs and punts for you? And... Do you have any reservations at all about using Jaden there with all the things he has to do on offense? Yep, we'll just have to see. We got quite a few guys that can do it, but we don't have any reservations about putting guys back there. You know, you know the, we're going to put the best players back there to get the, the most production and uh, to give us the best chance to, to have a chance to, to, you know, to get the job done. After last year, you came in with a lot of different changes, a lot of different I guess, players, you know, things that people from the outside didn't see. What did you learn from that? Is, is, do you have to go into a game, one in particular, kind of keeping things quiet and keeping things close to the vest for changes you make, 
for whatever other reason there might be injuries or growth? I mean, do you try and do you consciously think about that this week? You know, I'm not letting too much out. Well, I mean, we, we don't want, you know, we don't want to help our opponents. And, uh, you know, so, you know, we, I try to answer the question as best that I can, but, you know, I, I'm always going to do what's best for the green and white. Uh, Mel, a year ago around this time, yeah, I don't think you told us directly, but you told your team, you know, coming out of camp, going into that Northwestern game, that something along the lines of there's, there's championship talent here, maybe not championship depth. It, it, more of the story, it seemed like you sort of had a very strong feel for what that team was, and then we, we saw what happened. I'm just wondering, a year later, coming out of camp, going into game one, do you have a, a good grasp of maybe what this team is all about or what their capabilities are and whatnot, similar to that a year ago? Yeah, you know, right now we're just focused on stacking days. Again, we've already stated what our goals are for the season, and we know we're just stacking days. I mean, we have a process that we go through uh, throughout the week, um, and uh, so it was like it was a Tuesday type practice for us, well, which was full pads, and it was a physical practice, and and uh, you know we competed. We did mostly scout work, but we did have some. We did have a couple good on good periods, which uh, in the, we're going to go and grade the film. But you know, it's really right now. So we have one game. You know, we have a one game focus. We have one game on our schedule. And, that's, and we're working to stack days in preparation that we can go out there and put our best foot forward and have a chance to win the football game. Well, not to tip anyone off, but you had a meal ticket in the backfield last year in Walker. Do you, do you anticipate one of these two guys, Berger or Broussard, being the lead back? Or are you comfortable with running back by committee? Or where does that stand? We'll just have to see. I mean, it's going to take all of us. It's going to take in the offensive line, um, the tight ends, the runners. You know, the wide receiver is blocking. You know, we have a good scheme. We're going to have to, you know, uh, Peyton's going to have to make sure we get in and out of, you know, the, the right plays and things like that. And we're going to have to play complimentary football. You know, offense and defense and special teams working, working together. But we have to be able to run the ball on our terms and have balance on offense. I, kind of back to what I was asking a little bit about, when it comes to a week one game plan, when there is, and not just from you, but obviously Western has a new coordinator and there are things that aren't there. How do you as a coach approach that? When you know, you, you kind of alluded to it a little bit last week that it's a rules game, but when you get into game week, what does that rules game mean? Well, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna you know, we have to practice some plays you know, that, that you know, we think they may run or that they have shown. And, you know, you got, you know, a couple of different programs that, you know, we're, you know, we've been studying. And so, you know, we have to, you know, pick and choose, um, you know, which plays we're going to run and, and things like that, that, you know, will, you know, maybe resemble what we might see in the game, but we don't know for sure what we're going to see. Do you do a lot of scouting on, on North Central? I mean, do you have to do that? You yes, you have to do that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you have to do that and then, you know, Western and, and, and uh, you have to go back years, you know, things like that, to uh, to try to get the best pitcher, and then then you have to decide. So here are the plays we're going to present to the players, you know, to to run and practice with our scout teams and things like that. But you have to, you know, you have to coach in concepts, you know, so because um, we don't know what we're going to see, um, you know, from from them, you know, for sure we don't we don't know. We're going to have to be able to adjust, you know, and adapt during the game and do a really good job, you know, uh, identifying what we're seeing, have really good communication on the staff, you know, from the box, you know, and then communicate with the players and be able to make adjustments, uh, you know, to what we see out there. But, you know, when you teach in, in concepts, uh, you know, the players should be able to unwind anything that they see out there and apply the rule, like for example, if it's a coverage, you know, um, maybe there's a look that a play that we haven't seen or uh, before. Um, it might be something. Should they, maybe they got it from another school and it worked well, and they they might have got it from an NFL team, you know. And so, uh, so within that coverage, you know, the cover says if this, then you do this. You know, I mean, there's five eligibles out there and things like that. You got two by two, three by one, you know, empty, you know, two back, you know, one back, 
you know, all those deals. So, I mean, uh, so they, they, those, those plays fit into some type of category. And uh, then you apply the rule that you have for that coverage or that front or that, that, that blitz, that pressure. You know, you apply the rule to that category of plays, and, and that's what makes it a rules game. Tucker's team is more than a three-touchdown favorite against Western Michigan, but don't tell Coach Tuck. He says with everything they've seen from the Broncos, they will be better than that, stronger than that, and faster than that, offering the quote of the day, we have to play our fannies off. Welcome back. Inside Press Conference Monday here on Big Ten Live. Our apologies for that small technical difficulty. Monday morning, Gremlins running wild. Do want to talk about Purdue. Boilermakers coming off a nine-win season. Aiden O'Connell, one of the most decorated quarterbacks in terms of stats nationwide a year ago. And now a monster opener on Thursday night on Fox against Penn State. You look at this schedule and that Penn State game and perhaps the road trip to Minnesota the only two of Purdue's first seven games in which the Boilermakers will not be favored. That means this could be a huge step toward replicating last year's success for Jeff Brom and his football team. Let's head to West Lafayette. Listen in to the head boiler. Well, we're excited to get this season started off, uh, you know, this upcoming Thursday at home against an outstanding opponent with a lot of history and tradition in Penn State. Uh, we definitely Realize we'll have our hands full. This is a very talented team, well coached, a lot of athletes. They're big. Uh, as I said before, we played them three years ago, and uh, it was 21 to nothing before we blinked, and we just kind of had to fight and scrap just to not get blown off the field. So this will really test us and see where we stand right off the bat, but uh, that's, that's why you play the game. I do know our guys have worked hard uh, between the time of last season and uh, this upcoming game. Our coaches have put a lot in the time. But so is every team across the country. So we've got to go out and, and, and play at a high level. Um, I know on defense they have six or seven guys back. Uh, they didn't have their best player on the D-line in the bowl game, number 97, who is definitely a force. Uh, and he's somebody that we're going to have to account for at all times uh, because uh, he's one of the best in the country, in our opinion. They have a veteran secondary safety who's played a lot of football. His instinctive makes a lot of plays, number 16. It's all over the field. Uh, two corners that have experience, um, number nine, number four. Number nine's big, long, and, and can play football, and the other one does a very good job as well. Um, as you watch, um, you know, even just watch the last football game they played in the bowl game, really Arkansas didn't do anything in the passing game. It was a bunch of quarterback run stuff that they were able to succeed with, um, and, um, you know, that's how they, they found a way to win. On offense, uh, they have really good tight ends, really good running backs, and a quarterback that has a ton of experience. Um, and a couple good receivers. So, you know, we're going to have our hands full there. We're going to have to, you know, really play good, solid brand of football in order to win. Uh, luckily, it's at home in front of our fans, which is great. Uh, we expect a, a great turnout, and I know our, our players appreciate that and look forward to a great atmosphere, and hopefully we can go out there and play well. Questions? Hey, Jeff, um, do you like opening with a Big Ten game? Well, you know, I think uh, if you can open with someone uh, non-conference that you feel good, you have a good chance to possibly win. That's always a comfort zone. But at the same time, you know, we know we're, we have a great schedule. It is, it's like that every year. At some point, you're going to play really talented football teams. We're going to do it right off the bat. And uh, I think it's just a, what it does do is it helps you focus more in the offseason and fall camp and understand that uh, as coaches and players, you got to get ready to go or it could be a long day. So I do think we put in a lot of hard work. Uh, now you got to go out and execute against guys you haven't played against in a while, do all the small things correctly, and our guys are going to have to perform at a high level in order to win. And just the importance of this game, I know everybody takes it one game at a time, and, uh, but still, you know, national television, blackout, you got a blue blood program coming in. Um, just a great opportunity, I guess, not just to open the year with a win, but maybe to make a statement nationally. Well, that's one of our strengths. Our guys have a chip on their shoulder. Um, they all think they've been overlooked to a certain degree and they're out to prove themselves. They're willing to put in the work to get it done. They love playing great opponents. So we've had uh, uh, a couple of good games uh, where we've risen to the, the challenge. Uh, at the same time, 
Penn State's going to be hungry. I know the last year didn't go exactly the way they wanted, uh, but they're very talented and uh, they're very physical and they're fast. Uh, so they present challenges to us uh, that, uh, you know, you're normally going to face one or two, maybe three teams of this caliber every year. Uh, and uh, right off the bat, just means that we've got to be able to do it game one. I do feel like we have some experience, so you hope that that can help you as you get going. But at the same time, it's a new team. It's a new year, and, uh, and new players have to step up and emerge. You've talked in glowing terms about Nick Carraway, and you expect him to contribute. I guess that's still going to be the case Thursday night, Jeff. Are there any other true freshmen you anticipate maybe playing, a, I guess, a, a fairly significant role? No, I think right now uh, Nick has been able to practice and stay healthy all camp. He's a big physical player that uh, really is instinctive. He's got quickness. He's got toughness. Um, at the same time, it's his first game. So you got to be careful that you don't uh, put him in positions where he can't have success. But uh, he has shown that uh, he can make plays for us. So we're going to have to make sure we get him in the game at certain times and see how he's doing, how he's feeling, um, and, um, and go from there. In the, the tight end spot, um, you seem to have some concerns after the scrimmage a couple weeks ago. Um, just talk about that spot without Garrett Miller and maybe how ready you think Paul Paferi is maybe to help and if you still are really going to have a willingness maybe to still deploy those two tight end sets. Well, losing Garrett was a blow. Um, he was a very talented tight end. Uh, he could run. He had really good size, and he blocked really, really well. And uh, he came into his, his own last year. Uh, it was unfortunate that he hurt his knee. He was having a great camp um, and could really stretch the field for us and provide a blocking element because of his toughness and tenacity. So he's going to be missed. Uh, Payne Durham, we've had to make sure we keep kept him healthy all camp, so he's been limited just to make sure we get him to the game. Uh, Paul Paferi will be his backup. He's a converted quarterback, so... Um, you know, Paul has worked hard to get better. Um, you know, when the passing game comes more natural to him, uh, blocking at the point of attack and doing those things is, is a little bit harder. So we've just got to make sure when he's in there, we're, we're asking him to do things that he's capable of. And uh, so we've got to be really conscious of that. We're working to get in the backup tight ends behind them ready, but they still have a little ways to go. And, and a couple have been out for a while in camp. So that presents a little bit of a dilemma, but at the same time, you got to put your best 11 guys on the field, figure out a way to give them the ball, create some plays, and get some points. And we've got to just be uh, somewhat strategic and smart with it. Hi, Jeff. Uh, just some personnel guys with Jalen Graham, Branson Dean. Are they will they be good to go for Thursday? They, sh they should be ready to play. Yes. Right. Uh, T. Dennison is is he going no, to be? No, T. In the Denison's mix? going to be out for quite an extended period of time uh, with his injury. He's he's. Uh, you know, it hasn't come around as fast as we all would like, and uh, th that's going to take quite a bit more time. Can this be one of your best special team units across the board? And if so, why? Well, we'll see. I, I, don't, I don't know if I'd go that far yet. I do know that we have experience at our, with our specialists, so our kickers, our, our punter, our snappers. Um, we do have better returners uh, right now. So we've got to piece it together. And, um, you know, uh, we've, we've prepared and planned hard for it. Uh, um, we have a new special teams coordinator that, uh, you know, has done a really good job and, and understands what we're trying to do and added his element uh, of some things uh, on a couple of the uh, teams that we have. But really it's about getting your best athletes on the field, making sure you cover, don't, don't give up big plays and then figured out ways to get a couple returns that can help us. And I just think gaining an advantage in special teams in every game is going to be important. And sometimes it doesn't have to be a drastic advantage, but we can't lose that battle. Uh, the, some of the teams we play are too tough that, uh, you know, offense, defense, and special teams have to figure out a way to, to, to gain at least a slight advantage uh, or it's not going to help us win. Where, where's your comfort level with Charlie Jones returning punts and – he, he says he doesn't like the fair catch, and that's something you value field position uh, during your tenure here in, in, in that area. Where, where's your balance and comfort level with him and letting him kind of make plays? Well, we're going to do that for sure. Uh, I think he gives us an element we haven't had. He's very natural in catching the football. He's very natural. It, 
at making guys miss initially, which is really important in the punt return game because you're going to have one or two guys flying at you that you've got to be able to, to react quickly. Um, you know, he's a good runner with the ball in his hand, uh, and we've just got to create some, some lanes for him to do that. But I, I think uh, in the punt return game, uh, he can go catch the ball and go field him, uh, which is half the battle, making sure it doesn't bounce and roll. Uh, and I think he can cover ground and get yards. And I think in the kick return game, you know, he wants to be probably more aggressive than we want as far as returning the ball out of the end zone. But we do want to allow him the ability to, to be aggressive um, because he has a ton of experience there and uh, he gives us an element that we need to take advantage of. With your transfer, you know, Charlie and Tyrone and Reese are, are guys that are going to play for sure on, on Thursday. I mean, just where are you at, where, where are your transfers at as far as having an impact in this, in this opener beyond those, those three? Well, I think our transfers will have a huge impact, and that's why we brought them in. Uh, so when you look at, at offense, uh, Charlie Jones and Tyrone Tracy have been very productive in camp. We've got to, they've got to make play, plays for us and be some of our difference makers uh, for us to win. Uh, on the offensive line, uh, Sione at, at guard and uh, Daniel Johnson provide us depth and will be in the rotation. Uh, and they've done a good job this camp. So I, I think at that position as well, that, that has helped us. Um, you know, when you move to defense, Reese Taylor has done an outstanding job at corner for us. We've, we've been able to keep him healthy through camp. He's instinctive. He makes plays. He's played a lot of football. Uh, we really like what he brings to the table. Um, you know, uh, Scotty Humpage at the defensive end position has got natural size and ability and athleticism. And, uh, you know, he needs to be a, a playmaker for us on, on, on defense. And, um, you know, Bryce Hampton is going to have to play in the secondary. We're not super deep in the secondary. Uh, we're working hard to get better at that. Uh, but, uh, you know, those should be the main ones that stand out. I'm sure I'm forgetting a, a few, but, uh, you know, those guys are going to play for us. What's it like to have three quarterbacks in your secondary with Jalen and Reese and, and Cam? Well, you know, it, it, it honestly gives them an advantage. Uh, you know, when you when you play the position, you can understand route concepts, look at a quarterback's eyes, shoulder, all, all the things that give you indicators of how to break on the ball, make plays. Uh, Jalen Graham uh, had a really tremendous year last year. We hope he builds upon that. He needs to be a leader for us. He needs to play as hard as he can in between the whistles and make plays. Um, Cam Allen, you know, I think keeps getting better and better. You know, needs to you know, just – do his thing, be in position, and then make tackles when, when he needs to. Uh, and Reese Taylor definitely has great instincts. Uh, it's hard for us to get open on him. Um, so I'm hoping that that's because he's really good, not because we're not able to get open. But uh, he's done really good. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, their background of just playing football and understanding the game is very beneficial. Just uh, how many offensive linemen do you feel comfortable with going uh, Thursday? Well, I could see us uh, – Probably playing around eight offensive linemen. If it goes up to nine, it wouldn't shock me. Um, you know, keeping guys healthy and fresh is going to be important as well. Uh, but uh, we do feel like at this point, there is some more depth in guys that are getting closer to get on the field. And once again, at that position and as well as the others, you know, who are going to be the difference makers? Who can we count on? Who are going to make plays? Who are going to be a dominant in every game? Uh, that's what you like to see. You know, even guys like Greg Long stepped up last year and, and – in some games, was a, was a really uh, great force for us at that position. So we just have to get difference makers emerge, and sometimes you don't know, do you get them on the field? And, and that's where we're a little young at right now, where um, you know, these, these first couple of games will tell us you know, who those guys will be. Big Ten end season opener for Penn State comes on the road Thursday night. Again, this is a Fox broadcast. Very important early season game for Penn State. You see, they also play at Auburn in the non-conference in week three, then have an early bye week before facing the meat of their schedule from mid-October on. All that and more on the mind of Penn State head coach James Franklin as we listen in now. So, Coach? All right, thank you, uh, Greg. Appreciate it. Um, like always, I want to thank everybody for coming out and covering Penn State football, whether in person or on Zoom. Uh, obviously excited about the opportunity, you know, kind of strange, obviously opening on a Thursday. Uh, so we kind of catch our catch ourselves kind of talking on, on different days of the week. Um, but it's been our our normal routine, which has been nice. It also allowed us to come into camp a little bit earlier. 
Um, so I like I like opening on a Thursday. It also gives you some advantages uh, going into week two as well. So should be a should be a great environment. Um, really looking forward to this opportunity for our players. Um, you know, one of the interesting things that's been talked about a lot, but I thought I would hit it one more time, is Penn State will open Big Ten action on the road, um, not only for the seventh straight season, uh, but the twelfth time in thirteen years. Uh, so I wanted to kind of reinforce that again. Talking specifically about Purdue. Uh, got a ton of respect for Coach Brom and what he's done in his six years at Purdue and really what he's done overall in his career. Obviously, um, got a ton of respect for what he's done on offense, uh, his offensive mind, uh, what he's been able to do really kind of throughout his, his entire career. Uh, on offense specifically, you know, uh, Brian Brom. Uh, has the title as offensive coordinator. Obviously, those two work closely. Uh, guys that jump out to us, obviously, is Aiden O'Connell, uh, six-year quarterback there. Uh, broke the Purdue completion percentage record at 72%. And I don't care if you're throwing on air, that's, that's impressive. Uh, tight end Payne Durham, uh, I think led him in, in receivers, led him in receptions. And then obviously Brock Thompson had a huge bowl game for them and, and obviously coming into the season uh, is going to be somebody that we're going to have to be aware of. On defense, Ron English, I've known Ron for a long time. Like Ron a lot, got a ton of respect for him. Uh, he's got a long career uh, as a defensive coordinator, now at Purdue, San Jose State, Louisville, uh, and at Michigan as a defensive coordinator. You know, something that we've seen on tape from them as well as things that we've, we've seen last year that we've spent a ton of time working on uh, and going to need to be prepared for that uh, is Cover Zero. We've spent a ton of time on that uh, this, this training camp, uh, really in the spring as well. Um, and we're expecting and, and, and ready to uh, attack Cover Zero. I think that would be a big part of what they do. Um, you talk about personnel, Jalen Graham, their linebacker number six, is a guy that really jumps off the tape uh, for us, a young man out of Detroit, Michigan, a senior. Uh, Cam Allen, the safety, and then defensive tackle, uh, Branson Dean as well. So those are the three guys that jump out to us. Obviously, there's other guys as well. And then on special teams, uh, Coach Maslowski comes in as a special teams coordinator his first year, but he does have history. Uh, with coach from Western Kentucky. Um, they got all four starters back. Obviously, the one that really jumps out at you, you know, in terms of uh, his resume is Charlie Jones, the transfer from Iowa, who was the Big Ten returner of the year in 21. So, uh, tremendous opportunity, also tremendous challenge, uh, being on the road. Uh, to open the season, Big Ten, Thursday night, blackout, all those types of things. Uh, but I've been pleased with our preparation so far. Obviously, today's practice will be really important. And then uh, do a great job on what we consider Thursday and Friday and then, and then get on the road to travel. So uh, appreciate you guys being here and open up the questions. We will start with Rich Scarcell from the Reading Eagle and then Mark Wogenrich from SI.com. Rich? Good morning, James. How are you? Good, Rich. How are you, buddy? I'm good. James, you uh, always talk about positivity. So why do you think your team will be better this season than they were the last two years? I think the biggest thing that I've, I've – it's been pretty consistent message, uh, I think, all preseason is I just think we're back uh, in more of a similar role than we've been in terms of depth. We got much more depth. Um, than we had in the previous two years for a number of reasons. Obviously, the COVID year, uh, we lost some players um, based on you know, some decisions uh, that were made in the conference. Uh, and then obviously this year, uh, excuse me, this past year, um, you know, you look at our depth at the quarterback position in terms of proven commodities or, or guys that you know, we felt were um, you know, ready to play in Big Ten games. We just were in a much different position, defensive tackle depth, which was a problem last year after losing P.J., <clears throat> and then quarterback depth as well. So um, that's probably the biggest thing that jumps out to me. But again, you know, we got to go out and do it. 
Mark Wogan, richsi.com, then Frank Bodani from New York Daily Record. Hi, James. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, thanks. You've mentioned a lot about Sean Clifford in the second year uh, with Mike Yersich and their offense together. Where is Sean at this year going into this game physically in terms of things like physical characteristics, arm strength, accuracy, mobility, that sort of thing? Yeah, he's 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 healthy and and a hundred percent. He's had a really good off season. I think him and Mike are really on the same page in terms of um, first Mike really kind of understanding what Sean's strengths are and being able to play to those those strengths, uh, and then also Sean being able to anticipate and got a good understanding of of what Mike's going to do and why. Uh, he's been really valuable in the quarterback room as well in terms of just their dialogue, questions that are asked um, that that probably the rest of the quarterbacks in the room have questions about as well, or just things uh, in more depth, you know, in more depth. So I think that's that's been really valuable. But I think their their uh, relationship as well as their familiarity with each other, I think, is is going to be valuable, and we're going to need it in, in game one. Frank Bodani, York Daily Record. Then we'll go to Mike Gross. Hey, good morning, James. Um, hey, Frank. Hi. Can you explain a little bit now where the season's ready to start, exactly how the two freshmen have changed not just the running back room, but maybe your running game possibilities, your look, what you have to work with compared to last year? Yeah, I think a, a couple things. Um, you know, Obviously, again, I don't want to keep saying this to you guys, but, you know, it's – it's one thing to do it in practice. It's another thing to do it in, in Big Ten games under the lights and things like that, although I think they're prepared for that. Having them here in the spring, I think, was helpful for that. Um, but I think they both have the ability to, to make big plays. I mean, it's pretty well documented that Nick is big and strong and fast and has a chance to go 80 yards uh, at, at, any, at any point in the game. Um, and to be honest with you, you know, I think, you know, the guy that, you know, maybe, you know, to everybody probably but him, you know, the surprise of, of the training camp, um, you know, was, was, was Fat Man, you know, was, is what we call him. I don't know if you guys know that's his nickname or not, but, but Katron, um, he probably was the surprise at camp in terms of his production. Uh, and big play ability as well. A little bit of a different style than Nick, but both big, strong, powerful backs that, that can make you miss um, and break tackles. And, and both have seemed to do a really good job with understanding the offense, understand defenses and pressures and protections and all those types of things. And then Kivon, a, a year older and more experienced. So, you know, that group as well as the guy that, you know, people aren't talking about that we also have a ton of confidence and faith in uh, is Devin Ford as well, who will also have a significant special teams role too. So I um, feel good about the group, but I just think we have a chance um, you know, this year to, to create some more explosive plays in the running game, which, which we were lacking last year. And that starts up front with, with how we're able to block and, and communicate and uh, impact the line of scrimmage. Uh, but then that's also, you know, having backs prepared and ready to to make that defender that is not blocked miss or bro break tackles and and be able to create the big plays, which are which are which are obviously needed. Mike Gross, Lancaster Newspapers. Then Donnie Collins. Good morning, James. How are you? Good, Mike. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, Jeff Brom, I I sort of think of him as. Uh, one of the group of sort of passing game gurus nationally, maybe with Kiffin and Sark whoever else, Sarkeesian. What about him, uh, what sets him apart within that group for you? Uh, what does he do that's so hard to deal with? He seems to be able to crank it out year after year. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is is being able to push the ball down the field. You know, they, they do a really good job of, of taking shots um, vertical passing game is going to be a big part of, of what they do and, and how they do it. Um, you know, but also obviously having the ability to, to throw for a high percentage as well, which, which is what I kind of opened the press conference up with, with, you know, Aiden's, you know, statistics. Um, so 
You know, I think that's probably the biggest thing that I think we're going into this game with is, you know, with the mentality and understanding that we are going to have to be able to stop uh, the vertical passing game and the shots down the field. You know, everybody's trying to find ways to, to be explosive. Uh, we'd like to be able to do it both in the run game and in the pass game. I think they would like to do the same thing as well, but it's obvious, you know, watching him and, and his, his programs over the years that typically it comes, you know, in the passing game. Donnie Collins. Learned a lot there from James Franklin. We know Katron Allen's nickname now is Fat Man. We know Penn State will open on the road in Big Ten play for the 12th time in 13 years. Those previous 13, they are 8-5. and five. And also that Drew Aller is now the backup behind Sean Clifford for week one. Not Christian Veyu, which is who we thought would be the backup through spring. But in fall camp, Aller impressed. And he will be the number two guy for the opener against Purdue. Welcome back to this press conference Monday edition of Big Ten Live. I'm Rick Pizzo. 2021 certainly didn't offer the start that Paul Christ and Wisconsin had envisioned. One and three in the first four games for the Badgers. Though to be fair, those three losses to Penn State, Notre Dame, and Michigan all against teams who were ranked inside the top 20 at the time they faced Wisconsin. This year starts quite a bit more gently. FCS opposition on Saturday as Illinois State comes to town, then back-to-back non-conference home games to follow against Washington State and New Mexico State. True, the first Big Ten game can't get any tougher than that. On the road against number two, Ohio State. Still, Paul Christ, ready Willing to get started this Saturday, Illinois State at Camp Randall. Let's head to Madison and listen in to the head badger. Well, as Brian said, you know, it's uh, it's truly exciting to be starting this season. And, uh, you know, a lot of work goes into preparing for a season. And I've appreciated how our, how our guys have approached, you know, every every phase of it. And uh, and now this is you get to play the games and you know the the schedule you know there's, there's 12 games on the schedule and as a team you you hope to earn the right to play more but as we all know you know for a player uh, and you don't know how many and so you just you're excited for them to get the opportunity to play and um, certainly been a lot of players that have earned the right to play and I think that's what it comes down to, you know, who's going to play, the, those that have earned the right to play. And credit to to the players and, and to the coaches that have gotten a number of guys into that position where not only can they play, but I feel like they can help us. And uh, we get to do that this week against Illinois State. And uh, you watch Illinois State and, and you see a really good football team, well coached and, you know, know a lot of those coaches and, and respect uh, a lot of those coaches and and uh, but it's you know I believe every time you play this game it's it's kind of the main focus is making sure you're ready for it you know and and our team is ready for it and and that's what's great about each week you get the week of preparation and I like the way it started today and and need to have a good week of preparation All right. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of reports out. There's a couple of reports out that Chase suffered an injury in practice. I know you don't like talking about injuries, but can you address that if that's what his status is? Yeah, no, Chase did. And, um, you know, it's one of those that uh, don't quite know kind of for how long, you know, exactly. But, but he did uh, last week um, suffer that. And, and uh, you know, again, you, you feel – Terrible for him because I, I really liked what he was doing in camp, and and yet the one thing I know that Chase will, uh, he will stay in it, you know, and when he can get back, he'll uh, he'll be ready to go. But uh, that that is accurate. Kind of a follow up then, obviously with with Chase unavailable for an extended period of time, can you assess what you know about Deacon and Miles right now? Since obviously Deacon ran the scout team, I'm guessing last year, and Miles. Right. You know, enrolled early, but where, where are those two guys standing, and how you have to get them up to speed now for as it, long as yeah. It takes. I mean, there's you know, you're talking about you got three quarterbacks left, right? You, you talked about Deacon and Miles and and Marshall, right? Those are the three, and and uh, 
you know, they've all got to get some work because they're in that stage where they got to keep developing, you know, and so um, it's always a little bit more difficult this point, but there's enough opportunities for us, and 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 that's what we've got to we've got to do. You know, I couldn't sit here right now and tell you who, who's further ahead or not. You, you know, Deacon certainly has had more overall reps, and and Miles, um, you know, had the spring, and 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 what he got in camp, and even camp's hard because you know you're you're focused on getting ready, and and yet you know I think all all of them have done a good job of of kind of the the preparing mental side of it. And and now you know, gonna get some more reps. Well, obviously you're going into your first game with the new coaching situation with the special teams, not having a specific coordinator. Mm -hmm. How do you think that went throughout the fall? Like seeing the rest of your assistants kind of step up into those different roles, and where do you want that unit to improve over from last year? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, first part of it is you know I've appreciated you know what they've done and and. You know, regardless, you know the special teams. I think what's what's fun about those units is it it takes everyone. You know, there there's you know offensive players, defensive players. There's guys that are uh, starters, and then there's guys that that is probably the way they're going to contribute on the team, right? So it's got every piece of it from the players component, and the, and the same to be said. You know, whether it's every year I've been in coaching, I mean, you've got a ton of coaches helping. You know, and and it, you know, certainly you've got a guy that's going to kind of help organize it, but you've got everyone really aside from you, you know your coach Bo, you know, is involved on the field goal, you know, protection, extra point protection, and, and Ross on the field goal block. You know, other than that, you got every coach in, in the you know everyone else helps out on it, right? And it's it's truly. You know, everyone's on deck. You know, that's the one phase or, or part of the team where we all jump in and, and let's go. And, you know, what you want to be is you want to be uh, another phase that, that contributes to us being the best team we can be. And so Paul Christ has confirmed that Chase Wolf, the backup to starting quarterback Graham Mertz, suffered an injury. Chris says he doesn't know, quote, how long – Wolf will be out. There are unconfirmed reports that Wolf has a torn meniscus and is likely to miss the entire 2022 season. Of all the Big Ten teams playing non-conference competition this coming weekend, only one goes into its game as an underdog. That team, the Rutgers Scarlet Knights, a one-touchdown underdog taking on Boston College this weekend. Not an easy start to the season for Greg Schiano and company. Also, one of two non-conference road games, a rarity for a Power 5 team. In addition to the BC game this weekend, Rutgers also goes on the road to finish non-conference play against Temple on September 17th. It doesn't get much easier at the start of Big Ten play, home against Iowa, and then on the road against Ohio State at the beginning of conference competition. Let's hear more from the Rutgers head man as we listen in to Greg Schiano. All right, here we go, guys. Another year. Good to see you. Thanks for coming out, for covering our team. And uh, it's time to get started. So we're excited. We had a good training camp. Um, you know, as I always say to the players, you have a good summer program, that gives you a chance to have a good training camp. We have a good training camp, it gives you a chance to have a good season. So we've had a good summer and we've had a good training camp. So now it's on to the season. So with that, I'll open up to questions. Greg, year three, you kind of had your chance to put more of your stamp on the program. What's different about this team heading into this year? Well, I think any time you continually go through cycles and the same people are going through them, you get better, right? So we had some coaching changes on the defensive side of the ball, so you don't get that. But then maybe you gain a little bit of uh, new ideas, things like that. The players that have been through it for two or three years, I think that's the key. They now have the culture. They are the ones who share the culture with the players on the team, the younger guys, the new guys. That, to me, is the key. And, and you know, when you talk about culture and people want to use the word tradition, tradition isn't singing a song or ringing a bell. Tradition is what the older players pass down to the younger players. Have you uh, settled on a plan at quarterback um, at this point, or how are you kind of planning to use that this week? No, we haven't settled yet on who will start. Um, you know, I think 
they all had good training camps. Um, we're going to do whatever it takes to win. So, you know, I don't know how many you'll see. Whatever it takes. What would it take to maybe play two quarterbacks in a game? Like I said, whatever it takes to win, we're going to do. So if, if I feel like that gives us the best chance to win, and I say I, Sean, myself, the offensive staff, if we feel that's the best thing to win the game, then we'll play multiple guys. If not, we'll play one. You just got to, you know, we're such a young team and we're figuring out who we are. This practice, you know, we got three practices this week that are really important. Um, you know, you get, you get 25 practices leading up to the first game. So, you know, this is about an eighth of our practices we still have left to prepare for this game, and they're going to be very important. Greg, at the beginning of camp, you said uh, Aaron Young was doing some things, but not everything. What's his status going into this game? Uh, it's not certain yet. Uh, we're going to see, again, these three practices will be big on what, what he's able to do and what he's able to do at the level we need to do to win the game. So those, there's really two two questions. What can he do and can he do it at the level that we need to win the game? And, and we'll figure that out. But uh, we got a good mix. You know, we're trying to figure out who's healthy, who's not, who's ready to go. And um, we'll have somebody to carry it. Greg, a lot of familiar faces on the opposite sideline this Saturday at Boston College. Just what is your relationship like with Jeff and, and John McNulty in the years since you guys have coached together? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of good friends on that sideline. You're right. Um, I'm really proud of Jeff. Jeff, yeah, I knew Jeff would be a head coach. Um, Jeff was great for us here at Rutgers. He was also great for us at Tampa Bay. Um, you know, you talk about Tim Lukabu, who was with us in both places. John McNulty, who was with us in both places. Those are really good football coaches and really good people. And then there's others, too. You know, there's some of our former players. Savon Huggins is up there. Uh, he's doing a great job. I'm proud of him. Steve Shimko, who, you know, coached in the NFL and now is back in college. So. Yeah, uh, it is. It's uh, it's really good. And there's a guy that worked with me at Ohio State was my graduate assistant there, Matt Turin, who handles the special teams and and works in the secondary. He's an excellent young coach. So there's a lot of familiarity. Uh, it'll be a little strange because you know I care about those guys, but when you're playing in a game, you're competing and you're trying to win. Uh, what stands out about uh, Phil Jerkovich when you watch him on film? Very talented quarterback. I mean, he's a he's a uh, NFL quarterback, which. When you say that, that means a lot to me. Um, he's got a big arm. He's very mobile, very athletic. So when things break down, he, he extends plays. He doesn't just run to run. He extends. He extends. Uh, has a really good feel for the pocket, a very good presence in the pocket. And I know John, uh, you know, having worked with John, John is really a good quarterback coach and a guy who makes a quarterback very aware of rush patterns, uh, escapability, how to extend plays. So I'm sure that uh, there'll be improvement there as well. Greg, I heard someone say the other day that year three is the new year five for a coach in, in the progress of the program. Do you agree with that, with where the sport is now? And, if, and what do you think that, what makes year three important for you personally to show where this program's at? Well, I don't know what the new year five is, you know, I'm not sure about that. I, I get the saying, I get what people are trying to say. This has been such a weird ride that I haven't really tried to, you know, with COVID and uh, the situation, you know, where we came in with the program. So it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a perfect situation when we got here and then COVID struck. So I, you know, I'd like to say, you know, full bore ahead year three, let's make sure. I'm not getting into any of that. At this stage of my career, I enjoy coming to work every day. I enjoy these kids. I enjoy our coaches. We work really, really hard, and we're, we're getting better. And it's just a matter of, with this young group, how fast will we be good enough to win? Uh, I don't know. Will it be this week? I know this. We're going to go up there, and we're going to let it fly. These kids love to play together. Uh, this staff loves to coach together. We're not going to play scared. We're just going to let it fly. And uh, if it's good enough this week, it will be. If it isn't, we'll keep getting better. We'll be a much better team in November than we are today. Greg, what did you see from Gavin this summer in his first camp that impressed you? And, and what, do you, what else do you need to see from him? Like, are there areas of growth that you really want to see uh, in the, whenever he gets on the field? Well, yeah, there's, there's tons of areas of growth. I mean, you're talking about a, a freshman at the quarterback position. There's so much to learn at the quarterback position. 
So I just think his overall understanding of everything that's going on, you know, when you're really playing the position at a high level, much like Phil's playing it at, at, at right now at, at Boston College, he knows everything about the offense. He knows where everybody's supposed to be. Um, when you get to that level, and we've had quarterbacks at that stage here, when you get to that level and you have the physical gifts like Gavin does, that's a lot of fun. Um, right now, certainly his physical gifts are ahead of his understanding of just by sh pure time, time he's had to learn it. But uh, he's very, very gifted and he does love football and he works at it. So uh, when you have that combination, it's just a matter of time. Um, so. Rutgers, one of the many schools still yet to answer their quarterback question. Shiano saying, quote, whatever gives us the best chance to win is what we will do at that position. Almost certain to see both veteran Noah Vedral and Gavin Wimsat, who we've seen glimpses of a remarkable talent coming up on Saturday against Boston College. Welcome back inside our Big Ten Network studios in this Monday press conference edition of Big Ten Live. I'm Rick Pizzo. After winning six of seven Big Ten games in the COVID year of 2020, no team in the league had a more disappointing 2021 than Indiana. Two and ten overall and not a single Big Ten win. Hoosiers can't wait to get started. They'll do so on Friday night, and they have a chance to pick up not just a win, but a conference win in their opener at home against Illinois, a game you can see on FS1. Other non-conference competition includes Idaho, Western Kentucky and Cincinnati. That's the biggest of those three non-con games. And that comes up on September 24th before the Hoosiers get into conference play. First day of October against Nebraska. For more on this Friday night's matchup against Illinois, here is the head Hoosier, Tom Allen. Good afternoon. So we're, we're back. So another, another season's here. So just... Uh, um, do have a unique opportunity to open our season with a team that uh, has played and, and we did not. So uh, last weekend, uh, um, got to see Illinois play and <clears throat> like everybody else did, but uh, just impressed with what Coach Bielema has done there in the short time he's been there and immediate impact, um, you know, even last season. And uh, I mean, they had seven games that were one possession games and so, so many uh, um, close opportunities there. So just physical football it kind of sticks out to me, the way they play defense, the way they run the football offensively and uh, just a lot of respect for him and the job he's done there and the team that he has. And so I uh, had a chance to, to welcome them to Bloomington here to open our season and also open up Big Ten play. So uh, when I think about their offense, uh, obviously the running back, uh, Chase Brown's really special. And uh, that's a great season last year and, and uh, showed it again on Saturday and big physical offensive line and new quarterback and Tommy DeVito that uh, really seems to be a great fit for what they're doing schematically. and. And Isaiah Williams is a very, very talented receiver. I really like their tight ends. Um, and they got a lot of receivers. I had a bunch of guys caught the ball Saturday. And so it gives you a lot of things to defend. So a uh, new system uh, that uh, we're obviously didn't have to show a lot um, on Saturday. But uh, um, we'll have to be prepared for a lot of things that uh, we don't know about yet. And then defensively, just uh, Coach Walter's done a tremendous job. Um, turning the defense around a year ago. And, and it's continued. A lot of guys back from my group. and. A good length in the secondary. Um, just really impressed. You know, the, the Brown twins, uh, one on offense, one on defense. Uh, really, really good football players, physical, athletic, and uh, very, very active. And so just impressed with their linebackers, physical D line. They make it tough on you up front and uh, try to keep the ball in front of them. So um, good system on both sides of the ball, special teams as well. Um, they uh, got a new punter, had a really, really talented one a year ago, and got another good one. And, Started the game with a big kickoff return, so uh, strong on special teams as well. So, Big Ten football is what you expect. Uh, really good football teams every single week, and a tremendous challenge, great opportunity. Excited for our players to open our season. Uh, tired hitting each other. It's been a long fall camp, a little bit longer than normal uh, because of the new format, but uh, guys have been busting their tails and, and doing a tremendous job of, of buying in and, and uh, got some new faces, and uh, excited to see these guys come together and play. and and do it in front of our fans uh, opening night on, on September 2nd. So, questions? I guess philosophically for you, uh, new quarterback, probably new starting running back, um, you know, even some guys maybe that are going to be starting for you that, that have been here but not been in such prominent roles in the past. Is this 
you know, as you think about it as a head coach and you think about what the growing pains of week one might look like and, and sort of figuring things out on the fly, is this as much kind of, I guess, uncertainty, for lack of a better word, as, as you can remember facing in your career in week one? Yeah, I would say <clears throat> probably the most number of new faces without question uh, that'll be playing uh, opening night with uh, such a high caliber opponent um, and not have any preseason games or anything other than our scrimmages. So, yeah, definitely a lot of unknowns. And so I think that, uh, you know, that can be exciting. It also can be a challenging, but I think, uh, you know, that's what you got to do, and that's where we're at, and that's what's in front of us. And so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for our kids to play. And, but, yeah, there's, there's there's things you just don't know for sure. And, and like you said, a lot of different positions. I have some new faces there, and and, uh, and I'm, I'm excited for those guys. They'll be in those roles and uh, anxious to be able to see our guys go out there and compete and play in front of our home home fans and, and uh, in, in our home stadium. So I just think that, it, yeah, definitely creates a lot more anxiety, I think, for for the coaches, you know, but at the same time, a lot of excitement, and I can't wait. I wish, I wish we were playing tomorrow. Uh, how, uh, how are you doing, Tom? How did uh, you guys come through preseason camp health-wise? Is there anybody, any key guys that you're expecting not to have uh, on Friday? And also, we obviously uh, made your decision to quarterback. How did just that the first week go uh, with a established guy? Yeah, I would say first part, uh, rel very, relatively healthy. Uh, I don't say we're going to have every single person that we hope to have, but I would say it's going to be a high percent, you know, so uh, um, different than a year ago for sure. But uh, and that's been a real focus, you know, that balance of being physical and, and uh, being able to prepare ourselves, but also keeping our guys healthy. Uh, today was a very physical practice, full pads. It's a, a work day Tuesday for us on our game week prep mode, and so uh, full pads and really, really physical day today, which is awesome, and I love that, but also you try to balance the two sides of that as well. So I feel good about the health of our team at this point. And uh, um, so, yeah, I had a chance to be able to um, last week have uh, practices with our, you know, the, the, the starting quarterback in place and then obviously again today and, and will the rest of the week. So it's been really super positive. You know, it's been great for our, to be able to have those kind of reps and, and be able to have that kind of flow. And so uh, I'm anxious to see those guys go out there and compete on Friday night. Tom, not that you have any uh, choice in the matter, but would you rather be playing a, a softer touch out of conference to start the season, or are you okay with starting with the Big Ten? Yeah, you know, I, I would say that uh, the, the one part there is probably the biggest piece, and that is we got no control over it. You know, so I'm just one of those guys. I try not to dwell on the things I can't change, and and uh, um, but I, I think just from. A, being in this profession for 30 years, you always feel a little better if you have a, a, a preseason game, you know, to go through, you know, whether it's a preseason scrimmage or which we used to always have in high school or, you know, when I was at the smaller levels in college, we always had a, um, a scrimmage that we would go and play against another team, you know, and uh, it, just, it felt like a real game, but it just didn't count, you know. So we always had those and that was always nice and you felt a whole lot better going into week one with that. Um, and uh, there's no question that there's always kind of like a, a desire if you could just pick a perfect scenario you'd like to kind of just continue to grow and, and with your group so but that's not how it is you know so and you just look back and 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 you you don't focus on that and we really truly don't I mean I'm being very transparent with you but but uh, I think that uh, there are definitely advantages to opening with such a high caliber opponent you know and a conference opponent and, and there's no doubt that that creates so much um, you know, positivity towards your program in, in so many different ways. And so that's what I really like. And that's what we embrace. And that's what we focus on. And, and uh, you got to just, uh, you know, work through those kinks in the first quarter, second quarter, rather than working through them in the previous week. Coach, because you don't have that softer touch this week, are there ways that you have to approach this game different than maybe you would have if you did have a different opponent? Like, you know, I mean, or? yeah, you, I don't know other than the fact that, that we've really been working hard to create um, the preseason feel and in, in practices, you know, the game like feel the when I say preseason, I'm talking like a preseason game, you know, and then we talk in you know, each one of those, we talk preseason game number one and even even in today's practice, just the, the physicality of it all. You're just trying to simulate those things that that uh, you, you get from a game situation and you know going into the stadium and and being under the lights like we did last Friday night, you know, which was really, really important to do. And so just going through all that for, to me to try and just kind of create that situation for your team and from a mental perspective, from a physical perspective. And, and matter of fact, we did some mock games with our staff, you know, and, and just to be able to simulate, you know, 
with the time and the decision making and all the, the data that we collect. And because we got new faces, new new guys in different spots, and even as simple as and people don't think of think about this, but we got four brand new GAs, you know. And so because all four of our guys from last year's staff all got full time jobs, which is awesome for them, but new faces for us. So those guys have roles on game day that we count on heavily. So just the guys in the press box and working through all that. So we've we've done that, you know. And so yeah, I think that there's no question you try to do all those different things and and uh, but nothing's like playing a real game. I get that, but uh, you do everything possible to get as close as you can. Coach, when uh, talking to people about Cam Jones, it seems like the consensus is that just he's a really, really good person. Are, are there any uh, memories or stories that kind of stick out in your mind where you know you just were like, "Yeah, man, Cam is just Cam is a really good, good person." Well, I mean, there's there's no question. Um, you know, I always think back on, and you do this long enough, you know, a lot of young men that you coach and. And gosh, I don't know if I've ever been around a, a more genuine individual that just cares about people. You know, cares about his teammates, uh, cares about his cares about his family. Uh, wears that heavily on himself. Uh, I mean, just selfless. I, I guess to me, it's just. Um, and I and I think and the first person that noticed it, t t brought it up to me was was Coach Wellman. So this was even a year ago, um, in between um, our special teams work and different drill work, where he's obviously part of all that stuff. He's getting all the equipment off the field to help the, the managers, you know. When most players are either getting water or just totally just focused on something totally different. And we're talking like the real big heavy bag, things that take you know, effort and, and just – and it's just like – and I've – I never pay attention to it because I was getting ready for something else too, you know. And so, but it was just like that's just something he's just so selfless about. It doesn't matter what it is, something small like that that nobody would ever notice. Um, and the way he leads this team and, and how much he cares and and all the times we spent together. So it's just a other focused person, you know. And uh, was a tremendously talented athlete, uh, but uh, yeah, he, he's going to be great in whatever he does, you know, in football, outside of football. So I'm just so proud of him and so excited for him to be um, a guy that's, you know, he's going to be voted. I'm sure here. Uh, three-time captain, which hasn't happened here very often, you know, and so uh, it's pretty special. He's a special young man. Allen said he thought the Illinois offense that he watched on Saturday was pretty special, and it was. 477 total yards for the Illini in that win over Wyoming, most in any game since 2020. Tommy DeVito makes his first ever start for the Illini, 27 of 37, couple of touchdowns, but the star was Chase Brown. For his efforts, 19 carries, 151 yards, two touchdowns on the ground, another touchdown through the air. Brown named the co-offensive Big Ten Player of the Week, sharing that honor this week with Northwestern quarterback Ryan Holinsky, who had a monster day in the Wildcats' win over Nebraska over in Ireland. Well, Brown will no doubt be a big key for Brett Bielema and the Illini this Friday night in Bloomington. Let's head now to Champaign and listen in to Bielema. Well, um, you know, for everybody else, week one, it's our week two. So uh, a little bit unique position going into Indiana. Uh, they got a chance to watch us on Saturday. And, and um, you know, they've had some turnover on, on the staff. But uh, the thing that I appreciate about uh, Coach and the way he's done things, he does it his way, and that's why he's had success. And I know they got a tremendous uh, chip on their shoulder to uh, do some good things this year. So we're going to go into a, a, a hostile environment. I don't know what the crowd's going to be at, but – we're going to prepare for it to be loud and, and crowded, so we'll uh, put in good diligence of work week. We came out of it, uh, I think, fairly healthy. Uh, we have two guys that we're still waiting on. Um, uh, we actually have guys that will get some information further today from testing. So uh, Josh McCray, I don't think I know that he won't be with us this week. I just don't know the long-term prognosis uh, to where he's at. And Sean Miller um, has a, a, an appointment today at 5 o'clock that we should gather some more information. So those two guys, really, uh, the only two that will be um, – um, uh, out prolonged uh, in the fact that they won't be with us this week. Everybody else got through it pretty pretty clean. Isaiah was just a cramping issue. He was cleared to play to come back in, and we just didn't want to do it at that point. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, really that's it. Uh, we had a couple of guys do well on both sides. I thought uh, for the number of guys, not, you know, like you take Julian Pearl, right? He had started for us on the right side at guard and tackle. He never started at left tackle. He's starting next to Isaiah Adams, who had never started a ball game at Illinois, who started next to – uh, Alex Pilstrom, who has never played a snap at center, to sit next to uh, right guard Zy Chrysler, who had never played a game here at Illinois. Um, Palcho was the equalizer. He's had like 88 career starts uh, at right tackle, right? So he brings our, our average up. But I, th that was like kind of a microcosm of that game. You know, you see Tommy DeVito, who has played a lot of football, but he had never played one snap for Illinois. His 
you know, his first handoff was a big run. His, his first pass was a touchdown. Um, so there's a lot of positives on the offense side of the ball. I thought really on the outside uh, to see the, the development and improvement of Pat Bryant was probably one of the neatest things for me to witness and watch. But also Hightower, um, you know, with a couple great catches and just being a good player uh, in, in a good moment. Uh, Isaiah was really being effective. You know, unfortunately, his biggest catches and statistically his biggest numbers were ones that got called back. Uh, because of penalties. So he had a good day, could have been an exceptional day uh, statistically, but the leadership that he begins with, Isaiah Adams, if I could uh, sum it up in, a, in, a, in one word, he just amazes me every day. Um, uh, we have a team prayer um, when we sit down for uh, breakfast in the morning, we all collectively get together four hours before and I'll just open it up and, and, and he, he said some things that I just, I just think moved the room um, just in an exceptional way. So just continues to impress me with his leadership and diligence. Defensively, uh, again, kind of the same thing. You know, Zeke and Seth had played a lot of football, but really at the end of the season is starting outside linebackers, uh, Keith and Johnny, but we had new noses in there. Calvin had played, but we see, saw T-Ra and RJ, uh, three inside linebackers that played a lot of football. Uh, in the back end, I think you saw Quan Martin um, take a huge step in the way that he can play the game. Uh, Spoon as well. So. Uh, really, really like the growth of the room, and then really, um, Caleb Griffin. Even though you want him to see him maybe you know convert on those two field goals, he hit the ball extreme, extremely well uh, in the kickoff. Hugh, he was really, really uh, um, uh, a, a valuable resource for us in the punting game and uh, the snaps. Although we can have room for improvement, there was really good things there. So uh, we should have big improvements. We always say as coaches, you make your biggest gains from week one to week two, and we hope to have that. Indiana, um, you know, it's kind of a, 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 a another step with what Wyoming was, right? They uh, have had a lot of turnover on the uh, um, offensive, defensive, and special teams units. A lot of new players coming out of the portal world. The added element at Wyoming was we kind of knew who their coordinators were and what they were going to do, uh, but offensively and defensively and uh, special teams a little bit of a constant at Indiana. But two new coordinators uh, um, don't know exactly what that is going to be. So a lot of Friday is going to be you know about the ability to be aware and adjust uh, during the course of the game um, and handle the moments. But uh, uh, we'll start. Uh, we actually started last night. We, we changed our Sunday routine up to kind of minimize the amount of transition time. Even though it's a short week by theory because we're playing on Friday, it hadn't shortened our preparation. We got a couple of days of spring preparation. We had three days of fall preparation on Indiana. So we're actually walking into a Tuesday uh, tomorrow at practice ahead of where we would be um, in a big way by, by multiple days in our preparation. So uh, hopefully that's going to pay dividends. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. I know it's only one game, but how has the offense various schemes and whatnot met your expectations that you had when you hired him? Well, um, you know, I've said this before, right? Like as a head coach, I have I have expectations, but I think and I hope that our players' expectations are even higher. Uh, and I think that's 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 our offensive personnel right now. Um, you know, Barry Lunny included, right? So Barry, I, I didn't have a great moment to, to kind of have a couple words with him after the game. We had recruits in town and it's just kind of crazy and, and all that goes into it. So I, I had a moment uh, Saturday night when I got back and I reached out to him and I just expressed my gratitude for the work that he put in to have that day happen. And uh, his re response was, thanks coach, but we're going to get much better in the next week, right? Like he is constantly thinking like that. Um, uh, I think you see the potential that Tommy DeVito has, right? Tommy's a very accurate passer, very, uh, um, uh, you know, I think has a great understanding of how the game's flowing. And, you know, some of the best things he did Saturday are actually negatives on the stat sheet. He got rid of the ball when he's in trouble rather than taking a sack. He he did some things that he didn't force the ball into. Um, one of the stats I was very happy with, he was only on the ground one time, which is actually on the touchdown throw because they ran a D-tackle in late. Uh, so he wasn't in a protection. I believe, uh, you know, I made a big issue to him. And I said in front of the team, like, let's keep our quarterback upright, right? That's got to be a big deal and it'll be a key factor in this week's game. Uh, but when we got Tommy, I remember sitting in his living room with his dad uh, in his basement, actually, and his mom. And he had been sacked 86 times in his two years at Syracuse as the main player, right? 86 times. Um, he got hit once uh, on, on Saturday. I think when you keep a quarterback on his feet, there's a lot of good things that can happen. So uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, Chase Brown uh, just continues to, uh, you know, prove to us how special a player he is. Uh, a very, uh, very talented, but now he understands the offense. Some of the things that he does uh, instinctively have, have grown even further. And then what we did really well on Saturday was we blocked the perimeter. If you look at that very first play, uh, Chase does a lot of good things. There's some things at the point of contact. Um, uh, but uh, uh, Pat Bryant blocks a guy into the boundary uh, about 18 yards downfield that literally allowed the run to turn into an explosive play. And then Chase, you know, I just urged our guys to continue to, tr to trust the, 
the process to strain because if they'll strain and give him one more step, Chase can break a lot of arm tackles. Josh, do you feel better knowing what you know now with about him down the road? You mean that it's Saturday? Yeah. You, you know, um, I, and not one way or the other, uh, to be honest. Um, um, uh, you know, there was um, obviously some indications after the game, but, um, you know, I, I, I will say his spirits were very good yesterday, but we're waiting to gather all the information. Um, I will, Josh has uh, uh, been through, uh, you know, quite a bit before we ever got eyes on him, but his his uh, his last six months in our program have probably been his best six months. He's, he's changed his body. He is... Uh, uh, leaned up, um, was really, really good in his composure during camp. Um, you know, if he's with us uh, next week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, or, you know, two months from now, whatever it ends up being, uh, I have confidence in, in, in what he'll be. Um, he's got a lot of bright days ahead of him. We just got to help him get there. Repeatedly that you were doing Wyoming and Indiana prep during preseason training camp. You know, when you're doing that for, like, Indiana, do the guys know yeah. that we're doing Indiana prep? Or Absolutely. Or are you just doing stuff and – They'll eventually know that this is for you. No, um, I'm pretty diligent, and when we're prepping for people, we prep on the person. Um, it's nothing that hadn't been done before. We exposed them last year during bye weeks. We we prepped on uh, uh, upcoming opponents. So, yeah, even uh, last spring, I would say, hey, we're doing an inside versus Indiana here, right? So this is Indiana's projected defense. This is Indiana's projected offense. Um, I believe uh, we were about 13 days out from game day, 14 days out from game day, and we did a, a two-day window of Indiana, and they were very clear because we go into meetings and – Show them film on that, and and again, uh, no one knows what Indiana is going to do, right? That's an educated guess on on their coordinators and their past experiences, and uh, you know just following them through social media. And uh, Coach Allen, he's a very what Illinois does know. No Josh McCray this week. Not sure of the long term, but more opportunities this weekend for Chase Hayden and Reggie Love.